Madam Deputy President, at the turn of the 20th century, in the year 1900, the New South Wales Crimes Act was passed in this parliament. The Crimes Act codified the common law crimes of our state. 19th century crimes of the English legal system were brought together in statute and set out as the amalgamated criminal laws of the then colony of New South Wales. Division 12 of the Crimes Act, or sections 82, 83, and 84, related to a woman's attempt to procure abortion and criminalized such attempts with jail sentences of up to 10 years. It also criminalized doctors who attempted to provide an abortion with 10 years in prison. 16 years into the 21st century, these offenses remain stubbornly within the act. The abortion law reform bill that I'm introducing today is about bringing these 116 year old archaic and now irrelevant provisions in line with modern medical practice, modern expectations of reproductive health and the right of women to our bodily autonomy, the rights of a patient to make their own healthcare choices with full certainty of the law and unambiguously without a shadow of criminality. Madam Deputy President, while positioning abortion law reform as a feminist campaign, responding to historical and entrenched sexism and attacks on the bodies of women, this bill is deliberately gender neutral because we know that a range of people need to access reproductive health services, including non-binary people and transgender men. For the first seven decades of the last century, Division 12 of the Crimes Act was more or less the formal be-all and end-all of abortion law. Until the 1970s, the criminality of abortion meant that people seeking to procure pregnancy termination had to go behind closed doors and often risk highly dangerous illegal procedures. Operating in the shadow of the law, women and their doctors suffered heavily to undergo and perform what should have been readily available procedures. Maternal mortality remained high. This changed with the 1971 District Court ruling of Levine J in the R versus Wald case. And now famous Levine ruling established that abortions would be lawful if there were any economic, social, or medical grounds or reason upon which a doctor could base an honest and reasonable belief that an abortion was required to avoid a serious danger to the pregnant woman's life or to her physical or mental health. The Levine ruling was reinterpreted restrictively in the Supreme Court judgment of the 1995 Superclinics case, but then reaffirmed and somewhat expanded when the case went to the New South Wales Court of Appeal. The then president of the Court of Appeal, Justice Kirby, extended the Levine's consideration of serious danger to dangers that may be relevant after the birth of a child, spe specifically referring to social and economic factors affecting the mother's physical and psychological health. Sydney health lawyer, Julie Hamblin, who I must acknowledge today as having provided such fantastic legal guidance to me through the process of drafting the bill, has so clearly summarized the unsatisfactory nature of the current situation in the sentiment, and I quote, there is a clear disconnect between what the law says, what most people think it says, and what happens in practice. We know that many in New South Wales don't know that abortion is a criminal offense till they or someone they know needs to access one. But there is strong support for it being removed from the act and decriminalized. Around 73% of New South Wales people surveyed support decriminalization. Despite the district court ruling that provide exceptions for when abortion can be lawfully performed, the undeniable reality is that it remains a crime under sections 82, 83, and 84 of the Crimes Act. People accessing abortions in New South Wales and their doctors remain vulnerable to the full force of the criminal law, including up to a decade in jail for attempting to procure one of the most common medical procedures performed in our state. We know that many doctors do not perform this procedure due to fear of persecution and prosecution. Some estimates suggest that around one in three Australian women have undergone the procedure. At the moment, we effectively consider them criminals unless they can prove otherwise. We also need to place abortions and the circumstances in which they are currently performed into perspective, Madam Deputy President. Caroline da Costa, Professor of Obstetrics and Gynecology, and Heather Douglas, Professor of Criminal Law, explain, 
The overwhelming majority of abortions, 94%, take place in the first 14 weeks of the pregnancy, and 5% between 14 and 20 weeks. The small number of women who choose termination after 20 weeks usually do so in circumstances where there is severe maternal, physical, or mental illness, late diagnosis of severe fetal abnormality, sexual assault, or other exacerbating circumstances. While incredibly common, abortion remains in a gray zone in the law and is not fully mainstream like other medical procedures. It is not routinely provided by public hospitals. Relatively few committed doctors perform these procedures and mainly in the private sector. This uncertainty results in difficulties with access and cost, especially in regional and rural New South Wales. I would be very surprised, Madam Deputy President, if there were a single person in this chamber without a close family member or friend who has had an abortion, whether they know about it or not. And that, of course, is part of the problem. The criminalization of abortion leads to its ongoing stigmatization. People don't like to talk about it. There is a deep shame in the procedure. This should not be the case. Stigmatizing people leads inevitably to social divisions. And we see this again and again in New South Wales with the ongoing harassment, abuse, and intimidation of patients outside reproductive health clinics. As part of our reforms to abortion law, we must deal with this ongoing risk to the safety and well-being of patients who only want medical privacy. And I will discuss this in more detail a little bit later. It is time to move on and reform our laws to reflect what the community wants and what is actually taking place. As laws across much of Australia have been brought in line with the current practice and social expectations, New South Wales Order. still lags behind. Thank you, Madam President, Deputy President. Madam Deputy President, that is why today I'm introducing the abortion law reform Miscellaneous Acts Amendment Bill 2016. This is the first time an abortion decriminalization bill has been introduced in New South Wales Parliament. This bill is about access. It is about making access unambiguous, but also removing the barriers that keep abortion services privatized and expensive, especially for rural and regional women. New South Wales and Queensland remain the only states in Australia where the criminal laws from last century have not been amended. Let me say that again, Madam Deputy President. New South Wales and Queensland remain the only states where the abortion offences remain unchanged in the Crimes Act. Members will no doubt be aware that the Queensland Private Members Bill for Abortion Decriminalisation by Independent MP for Cairns, Mr Rob Pine, is currently being examined by a parliamentary committee. Now it is New South Wales' time to confront this issue. The bill before us today is the culmination of months of intense consultations with doctors, lawyers, health and legal professionals, academics and women's groups before the exposure draft state. Further feedback after an exposure draft consultation period has been incorporated in the final bill. I am confident that we have crafted a bill that is comprehensive and careful and meets public expectations in the 21st century. The Abortion Law Reform Miscellaneous Acts Amendment Bill 2016 does three things. It repeals existing abortion offences, it requires doctors to disclose a conscientious objection, and it provides for safe access zones around reproductive health clinics. Going into more detail into the specific provisions of the bill, Schedule 1.1 repeals all existing criminal offences specifically relating to abortion, that is Division 12, and sections 82, 83, and 84 of the Crimes Act, 1900. In doing this, the bill follows the Australian Capital Territory model of repealing abortion offences. It is my intent in this bill for Parliament to signal that abortion ought not to be criminalised, but rather left up to the policies and decision-making of patients and their health practitioners, as we do with other medical procedures. We do not have laws governing other parts of routine medical practice. We ordinarily leave it up to the profession to provide the best possible treatment and advice, and up to the patient to make the final decision. In practice, much of this is already happening in New South Wales. New South Wales Health, for instance, provides a policy directive for a framework for terminations in New South Wales public health organisations. 
This contains information about the appropriate level of medical oversight for terminations that may be requested in a range of circumstances. Schedule 1.3 modifies the Health Practitioners Regulation National Law New South Wales to specify that it constitutes unsatisfactory professional conduct for a medical practitioner who has a conscientious objection to abortion to fail to advise a person requesting an abortion of the objection and to fail to refer the person to another health practitioner who does not have such a conscientious objection or to a local women's health New South Wales centre. Madam Deputy President, this schedule does not force any health professional to perform a pregnancy termination, nor does it vilify them for not performing one. In fact, it clarifies that action must be taken by registered health practitioners who have a conscientious objection to abortion. This provision is to prevent a situation where a doctor who has such an objection fails to inform a patient about all their options, including terminations. Patients rely on their health practitioners for knowledge and expertise. This ensures that patients get timely advice and access. However, this schedule also makes clear that in the case of an emergency, a medical practitioner must treat a patient, regardless of objection to abortion. Again, this is no different to what medical professionals already undertake in case of other medical emergencies. Schedule 2 makes amendments to the Summary Offences Act 1998 number 25, to enact 150 meter radius exclusion zones, also known as safe access zones around premises at which abortions are provided, with the purpose of prohibiting behavior, behavior detrimental to health, safety, and well-being, or behavior that compromises the privacy and dignity of those seeking to access reproductive health services, or doctors and employees of those services. Section 11AC makes it an offence for a person who is in an exclusion zone to bother, beset, harass, intimidate, interfere with, impede, obstruct or threaten by any means a person who is accessing, leaving or attempting to access or leave premises at which abortions are performed. Sections 11AE protect patient and staff privacy by making it an offence to photograph, film, or record or otherwise capture visual or audio data for people entering or leaving clinics. Madam Deputy President, the maximum penalty for breaching prohibitions defined in sections 11AD and 11AE is 150 penalty units or imprisonment of six months. These provisions are largely modeled on the provisions in the Public Health and Wellbeing Amendment, Safe Access Zones Act 2015, which passed in Victoria last year and similar laws exist in Tasmania and the ACT. Madam Deputy President, I have been to clinics in Surrey Hills and Albury and witnessed the behavior of some of the so-called protesters outside these clinics. Earlier this year, as I stood with the community in Albury, I thought, why does a woman on one side of the Murray River in Wodonga have the right to be free from harassment, but a woman living on the other side of the river in Albury is denied that same right. It just makes no sense. And we also know that 81% of New South Wales residents who support exclusion zones around abortion clinics and service providers agree. Let's be clear, enacting exclusion zones is not about stopping people from having different views or expressing them. These are measures solely designed to prevent the harassment and intimidation of people accessing specific medical premises reproductive health clinics. This is about medical privacy, safety, and peace of mind for patients walking into and out of a clinic. In this spirit, I draw members' attention to Section 11AG, which provides that the proposed restrictions do not apply so as to prohibit conduct near Parliament House to ensure that people who wish to protest against abortion can do so outside the People's House. Mr. Deputy President, Madam Deputy President, this bill does not make a moral case for or against any behavior or any procedure. It is more than anything an acknowledgement that abortions takes, take place every single day, that they are and have been accessed by our sisters, mothers, friends, family, and so many other people will, we know. And it provides a clear legislative commitment to not criminalizing this behavior. For those in this chamber 
who will be granted a conscience vote on this bill, some of whom may have some lingering discomfort with the idea of legalizing the procedure. I urge you to consider both that abortions are already happening in New South Wales and that the right to choose abortion has overwhelming support in the community. In a poll conducted by Lonergan in September 2015, some 87% of surveyed New South Wales residents support the right to choose. And the backing is particularly strong in rural and regional areas where services are less accessible. There was majority support for decriminalizing abortion, regardless of party affiliation, including Liberal Nationals at 75%, Labour at 77%, and Greens at 86%. There, are clear majority, there is clear majority support, support amongst men and women, and across all age groups. I know many members from rural and regional New South Wales may be thinking of what their constituents might think of how they will vote on this bill. They should be aware that people living in regional and rural New South Wales were more likely to have a view that abortion should be decriminalized, 77%, compared to people in Sydney, 70%, and an overwhelming support of safe access zones, with 93% of people in rural and regional New South Wales strongly agreeing or agreeing to these zones, compared to 87% in Sydney. This is, of course, no surprise, for it is regional and rural women who have to, in many cases, travel long distances to procure this procedure, and at great financial cost. Finally, I would like to detail the process that has taken place to bring this bill to Parliament today. Members would know that I first gave notice of a bill to do this in 2014. I reintroduced a bill in the current Parliament in May 2015 before launching the N12 campaign to repeal Division 12 of the Crimes Act in September. During this time, I have held many meetings, roundtables, discussions, and consultations with professionals, with stakeholders, with members of the public, who all want to see this done. I have hosted a number of public meetings in regional areas, a filled out, packed out Gleep Town Hall just a couple of months ago, and there's another one planned in Newcastle next month. I acknowledge the invaluable help of my staff, the volunteers, the Greens Women's Group, and the convener, Darrell Duncan, in the campaign so far. I also wish to mention the advice and support from people like Leslie Cannell, Caroline DaCosta, Philippa Ramsey, Kirsten Black, and Peter Morick, and Bethany Sheehan, and Anna Groth from My Body, My Right. In our consultation process to date, we have met or had discussions with numerous organizations who strongly support the bill including the Royal Australian and New Zealand College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, the New South Wales Council for Civil Liberties, the New South Wales Nurses and Midwives Association, the National Tertiary Education Union New South Wales, Women's Legal Service, Community Legal Centres, Family Planning New South Wales, just to name a few. But of course, we've come this far, not just as a result of the work of a group of stakeholders and abortion reform advocates over the last three years. It is the end result of many decades of campaigning by generations of feminist activists, doctors, lawyers, and people in the community who have been working towards the repeal of criminal laws governing abortion for decades. I acknowledge the incredible role of the women's movement in fighting for abortion rights, including the Women's Abortion Action Campaign. I also acknowledge that over the decades, many people, particularly women, have suffered as a result of the criminalization and stigmatization of abortion. Many of these wounds are irreversible. And I hope that one day this parliament will perhaps re reflect on and acknowledge this in a more meaningful and sustained way. But for now, I hope that we can work together to pass what I believe is a comprehensive and carefully crafted bill. Madam Deputy President, in June this year, George Williams, Dean of Law at the University of New South Wales, stated in an opinion piece in the Sydney Morning Herald yes. that this bill is far from radical. And he is right. Provisions similar to this bill have been operating effectively for quite a number of years in many other jurisdictions of this country. The bill doesn't do anything that has not been done before. It doesn't impinge on anyone's rights. And it doesn't force anyone to do anything that they don't want to do. 
It's not about encouraging or discouraging abortions. It's not about any compulsion, but about the right to a choice. It grants the same rights to the people needing reproductive health in New South Wales, the same rights that people in Victoria, the ACT, and Tasmania already enjoy. It says to women and all people who choose to have an abortion that they are not criminals, that we are going to remove the stigma and shame you currently face, that anyone who needs pregnancy termination service has affordable access to it and with dignity and privacy. The law must be brought into line with the reality and with modern medical practice. There must be watertight protections for patients and their doctors. So they are absolutely confident that they are on the right side of the law. We must make sure that patients are able to easily afford and access one of the most common medical procedures in privacy, safety, and dignity. The people of New South Wales, the most populous state in Australia, will accept nothing less. <coughs> it is not only time, Madam Deputy President, but way past time to make the changes proposed in the Abortion Law Reform Miscellaneous Acts Amendment Bill 2016. And Madam Deputy President, I look forward to working with members from across all political divides, all political parties, to make this a reality. I commend the bill to the House. Yeah, yeah.